Hello, everyone. My name is Chloe, the conference secretary, also the host of MDPI Open Access Webinar, Open for Climate Justice, Pursue Sustainable Development. We would like to thank you all for attending this webinar. The theme of 2022 Open Access Week has been officially announced as Open for Climate Justice. And MDPI is launching two special workshops to encourage scientists to join together, take actions, and raise the awareness about exchange of funding can be means of climate justice. We aim to promote connection and cooperation among climate movement researchers and the international open community. Sharing knowledge is the human right and tackling the climate crisis requires rapid exchange knowledge across geographic, economic, and uh, disciplinary uh, boundaries. We will record these lectures with the agreement of the lecturer and deposit them on our online database. And we will continue to build this database with brief introductions and summaries of these topics of this fascinating field. And we hope this event is of interest to you. And today is the second, also the final webinar of this series. We have the honor to invite Professor Lucas and Professor Truck Power to give us two scientific research presentation about climate justice. They have not only significantly contributed to our journals, but also be recognized for their great achievement in the research field. And we also have Dr. Unai, the um, MDPI scientific officer, to introduce us the insight of open access. And after the three presentation, we encourage all the audience to join us round the table discussion to discuss the topic of the open access. And right now, please let me introduce our first speaker is Professor Nir um, Krakow. is also the editorial board member of Climate Justice and section associate editor of Land. And he's from the Department of Civil Engineering, City College, of New York and an OAA Cooperative Science Center of Earth uh, System and Science and Remote Sciencing Technology. His research interest lies in the climate change, water resources planning, underground water and the land atmosphere interaction and extra. And right now, uh, please let me welcome him. Hello, hello, Professor Mir. How are you? Yeah, hi, please. hi. Hi. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Yeah, can you start a presentation, please? Yes. Um, yeah, so thank you for the introduction, uh, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us on this webinar. Uh, so uh, we, have, we have a lot of, well, well we have some big topics uh, today that, that uh, in combinations of those. Uh, uh, and um, so I won't be you know, trying to cover uh, it in a very comprehensive way by any means. Uh, but I'll make some remarks on climate justice uh, and in particular as it relates to heat extremes. I'll also share some research that I've been doing on heat extremes that's uh, related to understanding that hazard. Uh, and finally, bringing it back to open access uh, and some other things that we're doing in, in that regard. Recording in progress. So uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please, Juno. Not yet. Not yet. Maybe not in the uh, presidential mode, just a slideshow. Well, th there's also a PowerPoint version that I shared with you. If you if you prefer that, the PDF should work also. I think it does a PDF slideshow mode. Okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah thanks. Can. So, climate justice again is is a uh, is a big topic, uh, and it can be thought of as seen in this graphic from a, a group called the Climate Justice Alliance uh, as involving. Um, a range of, of uh, problems and then uh, prospective changes uh, in different parts of society uh, and in how we um, 
how, how society works, how the economy works, and how different aspects of uh, our uh, actions that affect climate uh, then. So one, one, one reason why uh, climate uh, change and its impacts is particularly concerning from a justice standpoint uh, is that not only are uh, the poor and marginalized people uh, more affected by it, which is uh, pretty much the case for any kind of disaster or any kind of uh, bad conditions, like it always tends to be the poor that are more affected um, well, in, in, in most cases. Uh, but, but also, uh, this is not just a, it's not a natural disaster, right? This is a human caused disaster. Uh, and the, 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 the humans who cause the disaster, right, tend to are disproportionately the, um, the humans who are uh, wealthier, right, uh, and are then also less affected by it um, relatively. Uh, so this is a illustration of that from a uh, United Nations environmental um, program report uh, th that um, estimates the per capita emissions of greenhouse gases attributable to, or carbon dioxide, attributable to um, different uh, parts of the population by income. Um, so as we can see from there, we can also see from, from country level data, uh, the causes of climate change are uh, overwhelmingly attributable to the uh, welfare part of the population, uh, both between countries and within countries. Next slide. Uh, however, the uh, places and people that that are that then are most impacted by climate risks. Uh, so even though uh, climate related uh, disasters and and uh, various kinds of of extreme events uh, affect. Uh, people from all walks of life, uh, in, you know, the, the, uh, they, they occur in um, pretty much every country uh, and um, across different kinds of environments. Uh, they do affect the poor um, to a larger extent compared to because they're, they're more vulnerable, they're, they tend to be uh, in uh, these places that are um, going to experience uh, a, a bigger bunt of these risks. Uh, and they're less able to uh, get away from or, uh, or cope with uh, these disasters. Uh, so this is a uh, illustration on the country level uh, of the, uh, this is not really so much climate change as uh, climate related disasters uh, and their relative impacts uh, on different countries um, historically in the last 20 years. Uh, so we can see that it tends to be uh, poor countries that are more impacted and therefore have these higher rankings uh, as showing these lighter colors. Next slide. And um, in terms of, of the places which have had the most impact specifically from the warming part of global warming, uh, even though there are other effects such as sea level rise and extreme precipitation uh, that are also uh, impactful. Uh, so these tend to be in the topics and subtopics uh, which again are areas uh, where the population is uh, uh, tends to be poor and and uh, uh, than in uh, say other parts of the world, uh, and also tend to be areas which haven't contributed uh, as much to the uh, causes of global warming. Uh, so this is a paper by uh, Mora et al. Uh, that uh, looked at. Uh, changes in the global risk of temperature and humidity going above a deadly heat threshold that's defined based on the heat and humidity uh, in previous heat waves that have caused large amounts of deaths uh, using the support vector machines to identify uh, the best uh, threshold. Uh, and regardless of the specific threshold they use, you can see that, that compared to the historical run, uh, the number of days per year over the threshold increases drastically. Uh, again, especially in the topics and subtopics. Next slide. So uh, we're going to talk a bit more about uh, heat specifically as a uh, climate hazard uh, and then as a climate justice concern. Uh, so uh, heat doesn't get as much press as some other kinds of extreme weather, such as uh, floods and uh, hurricanes, droughts, um, and, and uh, so, so these, these more sudden um, 
or, or and, and more and more uh, visible events. Uh, but it's a it's the deadliest weather phenomenon compared to others. All right, so, so it kills more people. Uh, and uh, of course, it doesn't only kill people. It also affects uh, other species of, of plants and animals. Uh, and the basic idea is like if people have a temperature that 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 we we need to be in, uh, it's forty seven degrees centigrade for our body temperature, uh, and we generate heat, uh, so we need to dissipate that heat. So the environment has to be cooler than our than our temperature, right? Than our internal temperature. Uh, we can manage in environments which are hotter than our internal temperature if they're also dry, because then we can sweat and dissipate heat by evaporative cooling. Uh, but if it's too hot and humid uh, and uh, we're not able to dissipate heat, uh, and especially if we're uh, working hard, right, so we're generating more heat, then uh, we overheat, right, so our temperature rises uh, and it only needs to rise a few degrees uh, for us to become uh, incapacitated and, and, and die uh, right, if it gets too hot uh, for, um, for too long. Uh, so there are different vulnerable groups, uh, but uh, in essence, uh, this is something that is uh, intrinsic to being human or actually being any kind of animal like that we, we keep our temperature can increase above a certain level. Next slide. So humidity is also uh, important for heat hazard. So again, we can cope with heat that is about 37 degrees uh, if we can sweat uh, and dissipate a lot of heat by evaporative cooling. Uh, but if it's humid, then we can't evaporate uh, either at our body temperature, so we we'll definitely overheat. Uh, and that can be quantified by wet bulb temperature, which measures how much moisture is in the air. And it's also a measure of how, how cool it's possible to get, uh, assuming that we can uh, evaporate in an unlimited amount uh, and, and we're in the shade. Uh, and there's plenty of wind, so, so heat can dissipate as well as it, it can, given the conditions. Uh, and a wet bulb temperature of about 28 degrees centigrade is, is very hot and humid. Uh, so that's something that you would see in a hot summer day in the tropics and subtropics. Uh, and that can cause uh, overheating, uh, especially for people who are, are, who are working. Um, but, and, and there is a uh, narrow level of uh, tolerance beyond that, such as that 35 degrees C um, would definitely um, overheat and die um, within a few hours, even if uh, you're not working. Um, and the global maximum value uh, of upper temperature is set by the temperature of the hottest part of the ocean, um, which is about 31 degrees centigrade, uh, but that's increasing because of global warming. Next slide. So this is a pioneering paper by Sherwin and Huber uh, from 2010, um, looking at the maximum wet bulb temperature now uh, based on a climate model, um, or well, wind analysis plus climate model one. Uh, again, showing that it goes up to about 31 degrees centigrade um, in uh, some rainforest areas and uh, in uh, South Asia, uh, especially for example, in the uh, Northern India and Pakistan, uh, and also gets close to that in Eastern China. Next slide. Uh, whereas if you have a high degree of global warming, uh, what temperature will increase uh, to above uh, lethal levels uh, in uh, not only those areas that are currently very hot, but uh, also in mid-latitude areas like in the Eastern United States. Um, so we aren't at this point of global warming yet, but that's this, what they saw this as a warning uh, that uh, global warming will literally become intolerable uh, for a lot, lot of the world. Next slide. Uh, and this is back to the Mora paper uh, showing that, uh, so this is showing that uh, warming pattern by latitude uh, in the top uh, set of panels in the, in the top row. Uh, so showing that the equatorial areas are the ones that are close to the, the deadly heat limit that they established. Uh, and um, the second row shows, uh, for example, for Jakarta and Indonesia uh, near the equator, uh, that's already fairly close to this deadly heat limit, so it's, it's already hot and humid. Uh, so it only needs a small amount of warming to go past that and experience this deadly heat on a uh, large number of days per year. Uh, whereas New York in the lower row, uh, in the mid-latitudes, uh, is 
usually not at this deadly heat limit that it's un uncommon. Uh, so with additional warming, uh, it will go over this limit more often, uh, but uh, still not on as regular basis as uh, places in tropics. Next slide. Um, this is a paper uh, looking at the effect of heat stress in terms of uh, possibility of doing work uh, in the summer uh, over India. Uh, so using a formula for, for that, for the hours where uh, the uh, work has to be curtailed because it's too hot uh, for workers to be able to, um, to cool themselves. Uh, so depending on the scenario, uh, we're looking at a 20 to 30% uh, reduction in um, the possibility of doing work uh, right in the summer over India uh, within the next, uh, within the century. And uh, so, so we can see that this will have a big economic impact and especially again on the poor uh, who will less be able to afford uh, the loss of work hours. Next uh, slide. So I'll say a little bit about uh, what the direction of research that I've been, uh, that I've been doing uh, on heat extremes. Uh, so I've been trying to quantify uh, how fast the extreme heat is changing uh, compared to the average, right? because usually when people talk about global warming and study global warming, they look at the average amount of warming, right? So how much is the average temperature changing? Uh, but as far as impacts go, for example, the, at, of, um, of overheating, right? Uh, then uh, we're concerned also about extremes. They want to know how hot it will get uh, on the hottest day of the year. Uh, so, uh, however, th th there, there is increasing attention paid to the extremes right, based on um, you know, these kinds of considerations that they are more impactful. And there is a chapter in the new IPCC uh, report on extreme events and a changing climate that's uh, 250 pages. Right? So, so it is a substantial amount of research that, has, that is uh, being done. Next slide. Uh, so this is from the IPCC report. Uh, and they find that uh, on average, the warming of the annual maximum temperature is similar to the average warming uh, over land. And they showed this uh, plot or this map of uh, trends in the annual hottest temperature, right? So the hottest temperature in each, each year. Um, and they mentioned that there are different factors that can affect the temperature extremes specifically, um, especially having to do with soil moisture and vegetation. Um, so having moist soil will evaporate more water and therefore reduce the temperature um, that will have a particularly large effect during these hot, hot sunny days uh, when there's a lot of evaporation. Next slide. Uh, and there's this paper um, that looks at uh, why we might expect uh, the hottest temperatures to actually warm more than the average temperatures over tropical land areas. Um, and it found that the highest percentiles of temperature increased more in land areas um, or will increase more uh, in the future. Uh, and that's because of uh, so moisture and, and these hottest days being days when there's actually less evaporation than usual because they tend to be days when during the dry season right, or during dry periods when there is um, evaporation less effective in cooling. Uh, so heating will make that um, make that part of the temperature distribution increase faster. Next slide. Uh, so what I've been doing is looking at, at this um, European uh, era five global analysis uh, that is um, available since 1979, actually 1959, uh, and com combines observations uh, with uh, the European weather model uh, and uh, advanced data simulation uh, to give us a uh, estimate of the climate state uh, for every hour uh, over these decades. Uh, and one thing I, I looked at is comparing that against station data and finding that both the mean temperatures and the extreme temperatures are well represented uh, in era five overall. Next slide. Uh, and I devised a measure of amplification of extreme heat, uh, where I looked at the change in the hottest temperature of the year, which is this T100, versus the 80th percentile maximum temperature, which is T80, 
uh, which is supposed to represent a typical summer temperature. Uh, so I'm looking at whether the extreme temperature, the T100, is changing faster or is it warming faster than the typical summer temperature, the T80. Next slide. And I looked at this also by climate zones. So I classified the climate zones based on temperature and precipitation um, to see if there are any patterns as to particular climate zones having faster warming of extreme temperatures. Next slide. Uh, so what I found using this analysis, uh, well, so these are just the, the average patterns of the T80 and T100. Um, right, so we can see that uh, T T80 uh, is largest uh, in the tropical and subtropical areas, especially uh, in desert areas and also over India. Uh, so it's not surprising that these are places that have very hot summers. Um, and uh, the T100 is um, well also uh, largest in those kinds of areas. Uh, so the interesting thing, though, is when we look at the difference between them, between those two temperatures. Uh, we see some interesting patterns. Next slide. Um, well, so this now this is looking at the change in each of these uh, between 915 and 2021 using this analysis. Uh, so all the red areas are, are areas where there is a lot of warming of about two degrees Celsius or more. Uh, and um, so we see that uh, well, both are warming uh, substantially uh, more in most of the world. Uh, one area where there hasn't been as much warming in the summer is the eastern United States uh, for uh, various seasons. And there's also some uh, areas of um, no warming over northern India because of the expansion of irrigation uh, there. Uh, but um, overall, we see that both have been warming uh, and um, again, with large areas warming by two degrees uh, Celsius or more. Next slide. So this is the difference between the two. And uh, so if we just look at the difference between the T100 and T80 on average on the left uh, hand map, uh, we can see some interesting patterns. So I chose there's, there's very little difference, difference over the ocean. That's all the blue area. Uh, so meaning that uh, extreme temperatures over the ocean are very uh, close to the mean temperatures because um, partly because there's lots of water to evaporate over the ocean, so the temperature can get very hot compared to the average. Um, and over land, we uh, have these desert areas and tropical areas where there's actually less of a temperature range. Uh, whereas the further north you go and the further away from the ocean, like or, or on the uh, on the uh, equatorward side of the oceans, uh, the bigger the difference between T100 and T80 is. And finally, the right-hand map shows the difference between the T100 and T80 uh, warming right over this period, the amplification of extreme temperature warming. Uh, we see that some places, um, for example, over Central North America, have had less warming for the extremes than for the mean summer temperature. Uh, whereas other places, um, including Europe, uh, and um, some places like in China uh, have had more warming of the extremes than of the mean temperature. Uh, so thinking about just the average global warming is going to understate that impact as far as a deadly heat, uh, for example, in those areas. Next slide. Uh, these are the climate zones uh, from uh, this analysis. Uh, and um, Overall, there was only slightly more warming for the extreme temperature and for the mean temperature, the T100 and T80 uh, were similar, uh, but there were differences between climate zones. Um, so particularly this, this um, oceanic temperate area um, that includes Europe uh, in the blue-green uh, showed substantially higher T100 than T80, right? so, so the extreme temperature is warming faster than the typical summer temperatures. Next slide. So um, to summarize this part of the talk, uh, right? So, so, I, so I found that extreme heat is warming about as fast as the average, but uh, there is regional variability. Uh, so we want to see what that's due to, uh, and also to look at humidity uh, as a factor in deadly heat uh, and get a better sense then of 
uh, how does heat hazard increasing uh, in which areas in which people are most vulnerable uh, based on that. Next slide. So moving uh, to a broader perspective again, uh, right? So what can we do about this extreme heat uh, and how can it uh, be part of a climate justice agenda? Uh, so one measure to cope with extreme heat is air conditioning. Uh, and we see that where uh, people who have air conditioning uh, are less vulnerable to extreme heat. Uh, so this is a study of the um, death rate uh, for hot days versus uh, not hot days in New York City um, over different decades. So originally, uh, the, in the blue lines in the, in the plot, or the purple lines, uh, where there was no air conditioning, uh, there was a big increase in death rate as the temperature uh, got up to our hot, hotter summer days. Uh, and that increase has not, not stopped, but it's, it's gotten smaller um, in the recent decades because most people have some kind of air conditioning um, now in New York. Uh, and so, so that's a, you know, it's a very clear example of uh, where we can have a climate adaptation measure that is costly, right? Not everybody can afford, uh, but it may not be available for different reasons. Uh, but does in fact insulate uh, people from climate hazards, right? In this case, the hazard of heat. Next slide. Um, so, however, air conditioning uh, has several drawbacks, uh, right? So, so uh, which in which uh, also uh, factors in then to its role in climate justice. Uh, so, air conditioning actually makes uh, the heat worse uh, outside of its air conditioned area, right? So generally it's heat directly, right? Because it, it, uh, it sends heat from right, it, uh, where it's air conditioned to the outside, uh, and then it generates more heat to drive the process. Uh, and further, it uh, generally uses uh, CFCs or HFCs, right? So these are uh, fluorocarbons that are very strong greenhouse gases. Uh, so they actually make heat worse in the long term. Right, once they get into the atmosphere uh, and they worsen the greenhouse effect. Uh, there's also a uh, temporal effect of air conditioning that, that makes people less adaptable to, to heat uh, if they do encounter heat. Uh, and air conditioning also uses a lot of electricity and can cause peaks in power demand uh, that may not be able to be withstood by the power grid, like, again, depending on investment in the power grid um, and the resources that are available to maintain it. Uh, and can cause blackouts um, and hotter conditions also are conducive to blackouts uh, by uh, making electronics equipment less efficient. Uh, so this is the again from a study uh, on um, the effect of air conditioning on, on heat in Beijing and uh, energy consumption. Next uh, slide. One situation uh, where Air conditioning will, uh, is not able to save people from heat waves, even if they can afford it, um, is uh, after hurricanes right, or uh, tropical cyclones, uh, where uh, we often see that there are uh, large disruptions to the power grid by an extended uh, blackouts after hurricanes. Uh, and after hurricanes, uh, there's not necessarily, meteorologically, there's not necessarily a propensity for extreme heat, especially, uh, but uh, there is the usual, whatever the usual heat is, which is getting hotter. Uh, and uh, therefore, the um, possibility for people being exposed to extreme heat uh, after tropical cyclones that have knocked out power grids uh, is increasing um, fairly rapidly right, uh, over time. Uh, so this is a, uh, there's some studies of that uh, that you can uh, look at. One possibility to uh, reduce vulnerability is to put power lines underground uh, so that they are less likely to uh, be knocked out, uh, but that will probably cost more. Uh, so again, there is a um, justice and resource distribution element to it. Next slide. Um, another, uh, well, so, so there's a range of ideas for cooling uh, based on evaporation, right? So based on uh, having more water and having more vegetation to evaporate. Um, but then we need to think about the effect on humidity, right? So these interventions will decrease temperature when you have more evaporation, but they'll increase humidity. Uh, so what bell temperature may not actually get, get uh, 
be affected by uh, the, uh, these interventions and you may still have dangerous heat. Uh, so for example, if we have uh, white roofs versus green roofs, uh, we may reduce heat uh, while not increasing humidity, right? Because these roofs will reflect sunlight, um, but not add more water to the air. Next slide. So there are different other ideas uh, that we can consider uh, for reducing the impacts of extreme heat. Um, so for, for example, having a new energy that's distributed so it's more resilient uh, to power outages um, and having personal cooling uh, th uh, that is able to uh, let people, for example, be outdoors right, and, and work outdoors. Right? So I think air conditioning doesn't really help for the people who are uh, working in fields or uh, in construction sites, which again, tend to be the uh, less wealthy part of the population. Uh, and these kinds of cooling interventions are not going to do much for right, uh, ecosystems right, and, and uh, agriculture, uh, which are going to be vulnerable to extreme heat. Uh, so really, um, ultimately, we uh, also need uh, urgent action to reduce the amount of global warming. Um, and these local measures are not going to be able to um, overcome the heat hazard by themselves. Next slide. Uh, so going back to the one of the themes right, of, of this webinar, open access. Uh, this is a study uh, look, or as well it's a op-ed uh, looking at the role of open science and climate change research. Uh, they note that open access uh, climate uh, journal articles um, compared to ones in the same journal ranking category uh, that are not open access, have more citations, uh, and also appear much more often uh, in the news, um, have more, have more uh, social media posts, and so on. Uh, and they suggest uh, a number of ways in which open access and also uh, having uh, open data and a reproducible science process uh, can enable a wider range of uh, stakeholders uh, to more effectively understand and then overcome uh, climate challenges. Next slide. Uh, and as part of this open access uh, push, right? So uh, one thing I'm doing uh, is leading a special issue in the um, MDPI International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health uh, on heat waves. Uh, so it's open for contributions uh, from different uh, sides of the issue, whereas, where, whether it's physical climatology uh, or uh, human health, um, uh, different kinds of social uh, interventions right, and, and uh, justice uh, concerns related to extreme heat. Uh, so that's open for submissions. These are the uh, already published articles. Uh, and um, if you're interested in that, then let me know or just to submit an article. Next slide. Uh, so I'm going to stop here, uh, and hopefully then we'll have time for uh, questions after the other uh, presenters have uh, have spoken so much I'm looking forward to. Uh, and you can contact me uh, via my email or LinkedIn. Um, my website has all my publications. Uh, and um, thank you again for the opportunity to address this uh, webinar. All right, thank you so much, uh, Professor Quackfrog. And, and Juna, please stop the sharing with us. And we've already have so many questions on the question box. And um, if you have any question you want to ask about, uh, please raise up your hand. And I, I can see that Georgios is raising up your hand. Yeah, could you please ask a question yourself? Um, I've already unmuted you. Okay, maybe he's not ready yet. So, and could you please uh, check the question box, Professor Krakow? Can you see it? Um, yes. Song do you want, do you, yeah. Do you want me to look at those questions now or, or afterwards? Yeah, please look at the questions now. And the first one is from Elsa Yard. He said, "What's the common features of climate justice, and what about the planets for who are not follow the rules?" Uh, yeah, so that's a matter of the legal regime, uh, right? And, and whether it's national or international, uh, 
and you know maybe we can have some social sections uh, also there uh, not um, part of a legal framework uh, so that's not something that I you know I'm, I'm, I'm a scientist and engineer uh, but it's not really my area of expertise uh, but I think there are different ways that we can imagine that happening all right thank you let's move on to the other question he has Thank you. A uh, public health issue by increasing the risk of heat-related illness and stressness food and the crop supply should also be taken into consideration, right? Yes, exactly. So, yeah, so, so hopefully that was something that I, I tried to convey. Uh, and I think that that's something that we need, you know, we need to think more about and talk more about. Yeah, thank you. And the next one is from Janice. He said, developing world always be more vulnerable to climate change. Besides of the economic issue, uh, what are the other elements we should also take into consideration? Thank you. Um, well, so there, yeah, so, so, so there are economic issues. I mean, so there are economic reasons and that there are also uh, reasons related to the, uh, the climate, uh, right? So, so places, different places are supposed to be vulnerable to high temperature uh, and or high humidity. Um, and then that, that can interact uh, with uh, things like uh, conflict uh, and refugee crises. Um, so uh, again, a lot of this is outside of my area of expertise, uh, but uh, there are definitely a lot of directions in which that could be uh, pursued. All right, thank you. So let's move on to the other question. Yes, many thanks for sharing. The extreme heat always impact the vulnerable communities. Is there any method we can take better climate action plans in um, in advance? Uh, yeah, so I think that uh, I didn't really mention this, but a lot of countries are uh, waking up to this hazard of, of heat. A lot of countries, cities, so different levels of government uh, and there are there are and there are also many nonprofits that are working on this. Uh, so there are different initiatives that are being um, tried or, or undertaken uh, to try to meet this uh, heat hazard, whether it's by providing air conditioning uh, or by um, providing uh, outdoor shade and and uh, vegetation, uh, so to trying to reduce the, the heat. Uh, so there, there are a lot of measures that are that are, are being. Um, undertaken. And again, that's something that uh, we can have a whole discussion on. All right, thank you. And the other questions, how do you think we can balance the heat stroke in summer with the excessive air conditioning? Uh, well, so I guess one thing is, yeah, we don't want excessive air conditioning, right? So, so uh, we want to have some kind of uh, fairly minimal air conditioning right, that, that will uh, not overstrain power grids too much. Um, uh, so, so we may need uh, some kind of demand response um, uh, measures that uh, will incentivize people to uh, use less electricity, maybe having tiered rates for electricity. All right, thank you. Uh, we have so many questions and due to time limit, uh, we will choose uh, just one of them to answer. And the one is from Yoshi. He said, is climate change real? Of public address for the future control of the resources? Well, climate change is real. Uh, I mean, definitely uh, in figures in, in many other uh, many, many other agendas, like, like, like anything else, like any other aspect of the world. Uh, but um, scientifically, it's certainly a, a very real phenomenon. All right, thank you so much for your answer. And uh, we would like to, if you have any more questions, please feel free to contact him after the meeting. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you so much. And let me introduce our second speaker. And he's uh, Professor Lopez, and he's also the section editor in chief of water from the Department of Rural Serving Engineering, Aristotle University of the Thessalonians and um, Grace. And his interest lies in the surface hydrology, water resource management and engineering, climate change impact on hydrology and water resources, and extra. And right now, let me welcome that Professor Lokas to give his speech to us. Hello, Professor Lokas. Yeah, please. Hello, thank you. Thank us. you very much. Yeah, we yes, can hear thank you. Thank you very much uh, for yeah. the 
invitation and I welcome uh, Professor Krakauer for the, uh, he did a very, uh, very nice uh, presentation, very comprehensive. Uh, my presentation, um, just try to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, before I start, um, I want to say a few words about uh, the uh, sustainable uh, goals uh, set up by UNESCO in 2015. Uh, we can see them here. Um, uh, well, uh, my expertise, uh, as uh, uh, Ms. Lee said, uh, is uh, water and water resources. Uh, so uh, water is um, very important, as we know, and is very important uh, for uh, these uh, goals. And uh, we can see how this uh, action, action number six, uh, or sustainable goal uh, number six, linked uh, with uh, the other actions. And uh, of course, uh, the last couple of years, uh, we had this... Um, uh, COVID uh, virus uh, uh, pandemic, and uh, we had uh, extra uh, considerations about uh, water and uh, protection. But uh, let's start uh, with uh, the basics uh, with uh, climate change. And uh, here in this figure, we can see from um, uh, measurements and estimations from the past how uh, the temperature uh, increases um, rapidly uh, over uh, the last um, uh, year, uh, century and a half century and so on. And um, well, we expect to do, uh, to, to have this um, uh, increased uh, temperature uh, due to uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions and um, of course, we used uh, model climate models, global climate models, and uh, various uh, scenarios, emission scenarios, or socioeconomic scenarios. And uh, we have a very large range uh, of um, uh, results uh, towards uh, the uh, the end of uh, this uh, century, um, and a uh, lot of uncertainty. But uh, as we can see from these figures, um, uh, despite uh, the uncertainties, uh, there is a clear trend of increasing temperatures and uh, also other impacts of uh, climate uh, change. So if we want to summarize uh, that, we can say that if we don't do anything, uh, the uh, global average uh, temperature will increase by the end of uh, this century by uh, four to five uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, if uh, we uh, enable and act, uh, do the policies that are uh, posed uh, by uh, the countries and the international organizations, uh, this increase would be about uh, three degrees Celsius. And uh, if we follow the pledges, uh, not enacted, uh, uh, the pledges uh, from various, uh, from the public and uh, from various organizations, uh, this would be about, uh, the increase would be in temperature uh, about uh, 2.5 to 2.8 degrees uh, Celsius. Here is a snapshot, um, it's a, uh, a series of map uh, for the various um, uh, the various uh, scenarios uh, for the first column uh, is uh, for uh, the middle of the century the second column is uh, for the end of the century and of course the third one is uh, highly uncertain but uh, we pose that uh, here is uh, towards the end of the next uh, century. What we can see here that um, um, 
the globe, the Earth is uh, getting is more likely to be hotter. And uh, if uh, we follow the mild scenario or the extreme scenario, RCP 8.5, this means that we, we, we don't do anything about climate change, we'll have a very large uh, increase, as I said uh, before, uh, at about uh, uh, three to five degrees Celsius globally. And of course, uh, this impact of uh, the uh, on the uh, mean annual global temperature would be um, everywhere the same, but uh, we can see the variation around uh, the globe. Um, uh, Dr. Krakauer uh, talked a lot about uh, the uh, extreme uh, temperatures. This is a graph from uh, World Bank. And uh, we can see how uh, the temperature change, the extreme temperature change um, would be uh, by the end of uh, this uh, uh, century. But another impact of climate uh, change is on um, precipitation. This is a graph from uh, the uh, European Environmental Agency comparing for the extreme scenario, the changes in uh, precipitation between the historical period and uh, towards uh, the end of uh, the century. And uh, we can see that uh, there are many places that uh, will have higher uh, annual, mean annual uh, precipitation, but there are many uh, places uh, around the globe um, that um, these are the yellowish uh, uh, colors that I will have um, a significant decrease of uh, the annual precipitation. And uh, if we uh, zoom in in Europe, uh, we may see that um, the changes in the annual uh, precipitation would be more severe uh, in the uh, Mediterranean areas, uh, Whereas in uh, the northern countries, uh, we'll have increase of uh, annual precipitation. But on the other hand, uh, the effects, the impacts uh, of climate change are much more pronounced and strict for uh, the summer precipitation. We can see here that the Mediterranean countries will be uh, much, much drier um, whereas at the same time, the Scandinavian countries uh, will be uh, more humid. And of course, uh, the extremes is a very uh, significant uh, issue for the extreme precipitation with the return period of uh, 30 years. Uh, Professor Tabari in 2020 published a paper that uh, discussed uh, and um, uh, researched uh, this issue around the globe by, um, uh, by categorizing uh, the areas uh, in humid, semi-humid, semi-arid and arid areas. These are the A, B, C, D uh, maps. And uh, we can see that uh, we'll have, we expect to have an um, uh, increase in the uh, precipitation with a return period of uh, 30 years uh, in all uh, these uh, areas. Uh, and especially in the arid areas. And uh, we can see, you can see down that um, in the E graph that uh, we have this positive change, the increase in all areas, uh, whereas in the arid areas, we have a much, uh, much higher variability. And uh, because of this uh, large um, uh, increase in uh, the, uh, precipitation in the extreme precipitation, we're expecting to have a uh, significant uh, flood risk um, uh, at the end of uh, the, the century and uh, for uh, the humid, semi-humid and uh, semi-arid uh, area. So we're expecting to have uh, higher flood risks. Uh, this is um, uh, another graph, but going to the other hydrological extreme, on the opposite, it's the drought. And this is a graph from uh, World Bank. And uh, we can see that uh, the 
the globe, uh, will, uh, most of the globe, uh, most areas of the globe uh, will become uh, drier or have uh, more frequent uh, droughts. Um, another graph uh, that uh, shows for the various um, emission scenarios by Wonders and Toll in 2017, uh, analyzing uh, two of uh, the characteristics, significant characteristics of droughts, uh, the drought deficit or severity and duration. We can see here that uh, there are uh, many areas around um, uh, the subtropics that uh, will uh, face uh, prolonged uh, droughts. Uh, and uh, droughts with increased uh, severity in all these uh, scenarios. And of course, going to the extreme scenario, RCP 8.5, things are, uh, are be, it will be uh, worse. <clears throat> in a publication of um, uh, the, uh, Professor Krakauer in 2017, uh, pro proposed and uh, presented a composite uh, map uh, for uh, flood and uh, drought risk. And um, here we compare the mild and uh, the um, extreme uh, emission scenario. And uh, we can see that uh, areas uh, in uh, the subtropics um, will face uh, prolonged drought will have a uh, higher drought uh, risk, whereas areas in the northern countries of the northern hemisphere uh, will um, face will have uh, higher flood risk. And uh, because of these uh, changes, uh, the renewable water resources will have uh, uh, problems uh, too. Here from another publication by uh, Dr. Dew in 2021 and for uh, various, uh, again, emission scenarios, we can see that there are uh, many uh, areas uh, of the globe uh, that uh, they will uh, face uh, severe reduction of the renewable water resources, whereas in uh, some areas uh, in Africa and uh, in the northern countries of the northern hemisphere, uh, things uh, will be much better. They will have more water uh, than uh, other countries. And uh, of course, uh, water is significant for the agricultural production. And uh, this is a map uh, from NASA from 2070 uh, for the corn production. And uh, we can see that uh, in uh, some areas, uh, the reduction of the corn, corn production will be uh, as high as 40% because of the changes in uh, the availability of uh, renewable uh, water uh, resources. So the one B and the reduction of uh, precipitation as well. So um, the irrigation water uh, won't be uh, available. So uh, these changes also have direct effect on um, the global sea level. Here we can see uh, a, a graph that showing that uh, by the end of uh, the century for the extreme uh, scenario, um, the uh, mean sea level uh, will rise by one to uh, four feet. Of course, there is a lot of uh, uncertainty on that. In a publication, quite recent publication, uh, we can see uh, the effects of global sea rise around uh, the coast uh, of uh, the continents. And uh, we can see variable um, uh, results, uh, but uh, it is certain that um, all of the coastal areas uh, will be affected uh, by the uh, sea level rise. If we 
In this publication, they did an analysis for five specific areas, say, for example, for Europe, we can see that the impacts are not the same for the Mediterranean countries. Um, and uh, we have much more uh, severe uh, sea level rise uh, in, um, for the coasts of the countries uh, in the Atlantic. Um, there uh, in the Mediterranean, the increase would be uh, less than 0.5 meters. Uh, whereas in uh, the Atlantic, the increase uh, would be, in some cases, more than five meters. So similar results we can see in northeastern uh, United States of America, China, Australia, and uh, India. So uh, all these are projections in the future. So uh, someone may ask, uh, is climate change real? Is it happen now uh, that uh, we speak? Yes, the, the, the answer is yes. And um, um, for this, I will show some uh, maps and graphs uh, from the Center for uh, Research on uh, Epidemiology and uh, Disasters. In 2021, last year, uh, we had 432 disastrous events are related to natural hazards, not only climate or hydroclimate, but we'll see the distribution. More than 10,000 deaths, uh, more than uh, 100 million people affected by these hazards and disasters. The losses, the economic losses were more than uh, 250 billion US dollars. Asia was uh, the area uh, most severely impacted by these uh, hazards in 2021. In 2021, we had a, a large increase in the number of disaster events and the extreme economic uh, losses and uh, the total top 10 most economically costly disasters in 2021 occurred in the United States of America. And uh, these uh, disasters resulted in a total economic cost of uh, uh, 112 billion US dollars. What I want to say that is uh, we, climate change is here and uh, we all, we face the uh, impacts of uh, climate change. So uh, for the same, from the same report, we can see the distribution of the disasters in 2021. And uh, here we can see uh, the types. You see that the hydrometeorological hazards and disasters, th these are uh, storm events, floods, droughts and extreme temperatures um, are the main uh, disaster events, both in 2021 and of course, uh, compared to the average of the last uh, decade. For the share of deaths uh, in 2021, we can see here a comparison between 2021 and the average of uh, the previous uh, decade uh, most severely affected is uh, Asia and then the Americas. And uh, by disaster type, again, we can see that uh, extreme temperature, floods, storms, and droughts uh, are uh, the hydrometeorological, hydrological and meteorological hazards and disasters are um, the, the main hazards uh, followed by the earthquake. And this is the share, uh, the global share of the people affected. Here we can see that we have a very large number or share of people uh, in Asia affected by uh, the disasters, both uh, last year and uh, the previous uh, decade. And again, the same here comparison showing that um, drought is very significant and it's uh, 
uh, it affects uh, a lot of people as flat uh, as well. Uh, for the economic uh, losses, uh, I said before that uh, the Americas and the United States um, had uh, the most severe economic losses in 2021. Um, and uh, here we can see that these uh, losses globally are uh, mainly to storm, to hurricanes, uh, but also to floods following uh, the, the storms, uh, earthquakes, and uh, droughts. So uh, there are uh, monitors uh, uh, in the United States, um, in the European Union, and in other countries watching uh, what is uh, going on. And this is a snapshot uh, from uh, the October of uh, 2019 for uh, the global drought risk at that time and the water stress. And we can see that uh, things are um, not very, uh, very good, actually. So um, as a conclusion of this section, we can say that uh, climate change is uh, here. We face the impacts, the effects of uh, climate uh, change in our days. So I am trying to move now from um, uh, climate change and crisis uh, to uh, the climate justice. Climate justice is uh, the main topic of uh, this uh, week. And uh, this is um, a, a terminology uh, of uh, proposed by Dooley about uh, the uh, climate uh, justice. Uh, the aspects and consideration of climate justice is the disproportionality between causality and burden, responsibility and causes, intergenerational equity, dispro disproportionate impacts of disadvantaged group, and climate immigrants. So let's see uh, who is responsible uh, for uh, the uh, CO2 emissions. And here we can see from um, the 1750 up to 2020, uh, the share of uh, the various countries. And we can see here uh, in the first uh, position is the United States followed by China, Russia, Germany, and so on. Okay, and uh, this is a cumulative graph, uh, not by country, but uh, by uh, region. And we can see that uh, the share of Asia uh, and Pacific, Europe and Central Asia and United States uh, are the major polluters um, or producers of uh, CO2 or equivalent CO2 concentrations. And uh, this is increased, this graph goes up to 2018. And uh, this is a snapshot for uh, 2018 data uh, for um, the uh, world's top emitters uh, of carbon dioxide. Uh, we don't have uh, large changes in China, United States, European Union, followed by India and uh, Russia. So um, it's only the carbon uh, dioxide responsible for that? No, there are also other uh, gases, uh, greenhouse gases. Um, and of course, carbon dioxide is uh, the major um, for, uh, percentage of this uh, gas followed by methane. And um, this has to do also uh, with uh, the uh, activity, the economic activity of uh, the men. We can see here in this graph that energy is uh, the main producer of uh, CO2 or equivalent CO2 of the other gases uh, followed by from agriculture. Methane usually comes from uh, agriculture and um, the other uses uh, have much uh, uh, lower share on uh, that. And um, here we can, we can see uh, for the various uh, countries, uh, the major polluters, uh, we can see um, from where these 
CO2 emissions uh, uh, CAM. And uh, we can see that for the majority of the countries come from fossil uh, fuels and cement. Um, but uh, we have to pinpoint in Brazil and Indonesia that the major um, portion is uh, due to land use and forestry. And this is probably is because of deforestation of large areas, both in the Amazonian area and uh, the Indonesian uh, area as well. So going back again to the major uh, polluter, the energy, uh, we can see the share of uh, the electricity sources by fossil fuels, nuclear and renew renewables. And most, this is a report by British Petroleum in 2021. We can see for most uh, countries, uh, the um, energy is produced by uh, fossil uh, fuels for burning, from burning of uh, fossil fuels. And um, in some of them, there is uh, nuclear, but also there are also new re renewable uh, sources of energy. And uh, I have uh, to show Canada and Brazil that uh, many, uh, much of uh, the energy produced there is uh, the majority is produced by renewables. And France, that the majority uh, of the energy produced by uh, nuclear power. So someone, because there are many meetings and uh, conferences and summits about uh, uh, climate change uh, and uh, adaptation, uh, how well are we going? This is a, a map showing the climate change performance index, how well the various countries uh, go. And we can see here that uh, United States, Canada, Russia, uh, are not going very well. Uh, on the other hand, uh, China is uh, in the medium range and uh, there are countries like uh, the Scandinavian countries and India that um, the uh, climate change performance index is quite high. So uh, moving to the uh, European Union, you can, we can see here uh, how the gas emissions uh, uh, change uh, during the last uh, 10 or so years, uh, quarter by quarter of uh, the year. And we can see that there is a decrease, a slow decrease in uh, the greenhouse gas uh, emissions. However, if we pinpoint in one, um, uh, one quarter of uh, the third quarter of 2021 and compare with the same quarter of uh, the last uh, year, the previous years, uh, the third quarter of 2020, we can see that only three countries um, reduced uh, the greenhouse uh, gas emissions. And these are Netherlands, Luxembourg, and uh, Slovenia. The other countries increased <laughs> the uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission. But I have to be clear and fair that this is just a photograph for this, the comparison for this uh, period and for this um, quarter. So um, what do we have seen uh, in uh, up to now, and uh, Professor Krakauer uh, mentioned that, that the uh, climate change crisis belt is around the tropics. The tropics are much more vulnerable. And we can, you can see here dots in, um, uh, in red, showing that uh, these areas uh, um, are vulnerable to flood and uh, sea level rise and uh, uh, other dots that are uh, in blue color. And these uh, areas um, are vulnerable to water scarcity, okay? And droughts and uh, so on. So, but also looking at the urban areas uh, and uh, compare that uh, with uh, the growing population in this graph, uh, we can see that um, the most vulnerable, vulnerable are 
cities located in uh, Africa, okay? And the less vulnerable, vulnerable are uh, cities are located in Europe and in the Americas. And the Asia is somewhere in between, but the, the more vulnerable are uh, here, uh, there are Kinshasa and Lagos are cities located in Africa. And you, to all this pressure, uh, until now we have not uh, faced uh, uh, severe climate change immigration. Uh, we have faced immigration, human immigration, due to wars, to economic um, uh, activities, and so on. But in the future, and we have to be prepared about that, that um, we, we are going to face climate change, climate immigrants of immigration. And uh, here it's um, a study for uh, the middle of this uh, period and uh, by region we, we can see that the most vulnerable area is again Africa with 71 million people displaced due to climate change impacts uh, followed by uh, Asia, East and uh, uh, South uh, Asia. But also we have to, I have to pinpoint that 6.1% uh, of the population, it's not a very large number, it's 13 million, but it's 6.1% of the population of Northern Africa will be displaced because of um, the climate change uh, impact. So all these are science and uh, we have uh, to communicate this, uh, si this uh, the science. And there are two types of science communication, the outwork, the outreach, and the inreach. The inreach is between the uh, scientific community. The outreach is uh, more or less to the general public, and this uh, could be done by science journalism, science museums, public talks, and so on. The inreach, uh, science communication, is uh, done by scientific journals and books, scientific conferences and uh, workshops, and of course, education. This is a, a graph proposed uh, by Karsten Kronecker um, about uh, the players, the scientists, the journalists, the public, and uh, the links that they are uh, in between uh, for the science communication and uh, dissemination. So it's very important to communi communicate uh, the results. And for this communication, especially uh, for um, the in-reach uh, communication, in uh, 2003 um, uh, proposed uh, the open access uh, and the principles set out by the Berlin Declaration of open, on Open Access to Knowledge in the Sciences and Humanities. Open access, it's a model of publicize the results or communicate with people without cost. The cost usually is paid, is paid by the authors. The most important advantage of uh, open access is that it increases the visibility and reuse of academic rich results. However, there is a lot of uh, criticism raised uh, about the quality and uh, we should take care about that. The people that we are involved in the publication um, of uh, results uh, that we should secure that the quality of the publication should be uh, high, okay, as the typical uh, other uh, journals. There are uh, three ways of publishing open uh, access. The golden route that the author pays, uh, the author uh, charges, publication charges. The green route that uh, these uh, publications are stored in a depository, like um, an example is the Narcisse uh, for the Danish uh, universities and research institutions. And the third is the diamond route uh, that uh, there are no uh, charges even for the authors, but here 
the, the cost should be covered uh, by uh, foundations, organizations, and institutions. And also this um, open access uh, model uh, should apply to conferences, workshops, books, and uh, so on. And uh, of course, it is applied. So um, um, I know that I talked a lot, but uh, uh, let's go to see an example for, uh, from the Journal of uh, Water and the, from the annual report uh, of 2021 for the previous year. Uh, we can see here the papers by country published in the journal, and uh, we can see that a very large uh, number of countries or people coming, scientists coming from uh, these countries, published. Of course, the first is uh, China, followed by the United States, and uh, but uh, I think uh, that uh, it's a rainbow, okay, uh, covering uh, the whole uh, globe. And if we uh, see the readership in 2021, uh, the readers of uh, the papers published in Water were reached to 12 million. So this shows how um, significant is the dissemination by open access uh, in the in the whole globe, and here in the graph in the map, we can see uh, the shares of uh, the various uh, continents in the readership of uh, the papers in uh, water, and this is again for them uh, the readership by country. Uh, first is the United States, followed by Germany, the Netherlands, and then China. So uh, I said before uh, that open access model uh, should be uh, followed for um, conferences too. And MDPI and Water uh, set up a series of uh, electronic uh, conferences on water. M most of them, the topics of the conferences deal with the climate change, the adaptation up to now, uh, six such conferences have been organized and I think uh, with uh, success. This year, this coming year, 2023, uh, we organized uh, the seventh um, uh, ECWS uh, conference, Electronic Conference of Water Sciences, that is with a topic, the theme is adaptive water resource management in an era of changing climatic, environmental, and social uh, conditions. So uh, if you want to submit uh, uh, an abstract of 200, 300 uh, words, you can do that by November 27. And of course, there are other actions by others. Uh, these are just an example. Uh, this is a, a, a conference uh, set up uh, by UNESCO, uh, the UNESCO Center on Water Resources uh, in my university, Aristotle University of uh, Saloniki, and the International Association for Hydro Environmental Research. And um, it has, and uh, this uh, conference was mainly for the young scientists to show uh, their work on um, water. And of course, uh, we set up uh, also webinars, uh, quite successful webinar was that, uh, that uh, we organized uh, last uh, October. Uh, the, um, uh, the number of attendees were very large. I think it reached uh, 400 attendees. Uh, in these web webinars, uh, we invite uh, well-known uh, scientists uh, to talk to a specific topic. For this one, uh, this is not the only one, I'm just an example. Uh, this one, the topic was climate change and water resources, evidence, impacts, and adaptation. Also, we plan to have in the ECWS 7 uh, conference, uh, two or three webinars um, um, with invited 
uh, well-known uh, scientists as well this coming March. So thank you very much for uh, the attendance. And uh, please, uh, Mrs. Lee, and if you uh, upload this uh, presentation, I have also uh, put uh, the references cited in uh, my presentation so people can see uh, also the sources. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much for your help and thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. And maybe you can stop the sharing. So let's check our question box. Uh, we have so many questions already here. Yeah, Professor Lucas, can you, can you see them? Yes, and yes. due to the time limitation, I'm afraid we cannot answer all of them. Uh, Professor Lucas, could you please uh, choose three of them to answer, if it is okay? The first one? Mm -hmm. Which one? Um, I think the first one is uh, starts from uh, from Danny Rigby. This one, yeah, maybe this one we can leave it to uh, Unai. We have already discussed about it. Let's start from the second one. That I think that sensitivity to climate change is more related to economic level of country and people. That impact of the drought on the farmers uh, of the Somalia, for example. For the series than the impact on the farmer of Spain or Australia, what do you think? Well, uh, I have to say something. Well, I have to be careful, but uh, uh, something more general. And I think that I, I have tried to do that in my presentation that the most vulnerable people are the poor within a country and the poor countries, okay? So uh, yes, uh, in Somalia, uh, the farmers are much more vulnerable, vulnerable because they don't have uh, the means, say, for example, uh, to irrigate in many areas uh, their crops, whereas in Spain or Australia, they do. But also people in Spain or um, farmers in Spain and Australia are vulnerable too, okay? But uh, for, uh, yeah, I agree for uh, Somalia or uh, other countries, poor countries, uh, this would be devastating. And this is why I show this graph of uh, human migration. People will migrate to other countries, and these people come mainly for these from these disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged countries. All right, thank you so much for your answer. So let's uh, move on to the next one. Uh, it's from Elset. He said, "Can you tell me what are the dangerous effects of global warming on both on and animal production, and how can we avoid this horizon?" Yes. Uh, well, uh, the the effect on uh, agriculture, not everywhere in, uh, but in many countries, uh, would be the uh, water scarcity. In the general sense, okay, and um, also it could be also um, we we didn't talk a lot about the health issues the health issues for humans and for the animals okay or diseases or plant diseases this is a significant uh, issue too how we can do that how we can reverse or uh, mitigate uh, the situation uh, well we have to to take action to try to uh, do uh, say, for example, for the water, uh, try to develop um, um, new techniques of um, irrigation, uh, water uh, saving techniques, and uh, so on. Uh, so uh, we have to adapt uh, and uh, we have to be careful and do that now, not in the future. All right, thank you. Well, if we try to do that in the future, it would be very, very late. Yes, totally agree. So let's move on to the next one. Um, it's from Yosef. He said, I believe that the climate has con contents the course of change, alerting between high and low. 
uh, under tight control. Do you think that climate change is the main link in destroying the earth? Thank you so much for your efforts. Well, um, <laughs> for the destruction of uh, the earth, uh, well, uh, I don't think that we'll uh, reach uh, that point that uh, will destroy the earth. Uh, I hope, okay, but um, I think that uh, over the last uh, 20, 30 years, that uh, we start uh, talking about these issues of climate change, many things uh, have been changed. Um, both in political level, but also um, between the people. People um, nowadays know what is going on. And, uh, you know, there are uh, protests about, uh, you know, uh, to the politicians uh, to take uh, measures of that, about that. So there is a pressure, okay, to, to change our act. And this is very hopeful, okay? So, um, well, um, I show you some graphs that uh, uh, the climate change performance index is not, is not that great for many countries and uh, the high polluters. But, um, well, I think through, um, because also these countries uh, face the impacts of climate change, okay? Droughts, hurricanes, floods, okay? They face that. I saw you that in 2021, uh, the, the, the most economic losses were in the United States of America, okay? And we, we can see that if we watch the news, we'll see people suffering for that, from these disasters. So I hope and I believe in people. So uh, hopefully things, I hope that the things will uh, change. All right, thank you so much, Professor Lucas. Thank you so much for your detailed answer. And we have so many questions. And again, to the delay on time limitation, we cannot answer all of them. And of course, we can uh, invite Professor Lucas to type in his answer in the question box. And uh, right now, let me introduce our final speaker. Yes, uh, he's Dr. Unai Vicario, our uh, scientific officer, and his mission is to improve the publishing experience of scientific community and promote the open access model. Welcome. Hello, Unai, how are you? Hello, thank you very much. Let me share my screen with you. Yeah, please. I hope everybody can see it. Yes. Yes. Yes, David, okay, so thank you. I, I would like to thank my, my colleagues, Dr. Krakauer and Dr. Lokas for the very interesting presentations. And now I will be focusing more on the open access part. So I will I will now be presenting a little bit about what the open access is uh, and how MDBI is supporting the model. First of all, before we go uh, into the open access, I, I wanted to show you this graph just to show you the bigger universe that it's the open science. And in the presentation today, I will talk a little bit about open access, including also some points like the open peer review or open data on the open science policies, which are all part of this bigger universe of the open science. So when it comes to open, uh, to open access, uh, according to UNESCO, open access means Free, uh, free access to information and unrestricted use of electronic resources for anyone. And he said that any kind of digital content can be open access from text to multimedia or video or audio. In this definition, it's very important to see that there are two points here, two main points. It means free access to the content, but also unrestricted use of it. And this is important because uh, if we don't have these two parameters, we will not be talking about open access. So this is, uh, I want to show you how the open access has been evolving uh, during the last years. It was, it started in the early 90s when uh, Archive, uh, the, the first preprint server was launched in the 91. 
1996, NDPI was already launching the, uh, its first open access journal. And it was on the 97 that we had PubMed coming and only in 2001, plus one appeared. Since then, we, we saw the, or we see that in, uh, in 2002, we, we had uh, some mandates and initiatives coming on, the Budapest Open Access Initiative, the Berlin Declaration, there were some movements there to support the open access. Then it was 2003 when the uh, directory of open access journals was launched. And in 2004, Springer uh, introduced the hybrid model with the open access choice. From that point, there were more uh, mandates coming uh, into place, the Welcome Trust, uh, the Horizon 2020, and it was in 2018 when Coalition S launched the Plant S. That was an, an, an important milestone, uh, especially in Europe. And well, uh, I, I need to say that it was 2021 when uh, Plant S uh, was in, uh, put in force, let's say. And we know that this will be continuing to evolve uh, because in 2024, coalition, coalition will no longer fund uh, journals under the, the transformative agreements. So uh, we know that at least for the next two, three years, there will be changes uh, that will still favor the open access publishing. So uh, Dr. Lucas has already mentioned a little bit of this, but we have different kind of open access. So we will be talking about a green open access when we are placing a version of the authors uh, into a version of the author manuscript into a repository, the, usually the university repository or the institutional repository, making it available to everyone. And uh, in this case, there are sometimes some restrictions, but usually we use the version which has been approved for publication. There is also the gold uh, open accents. This is the model that we follow at NDPI. Yeah, it means that there is an, um, we have immediate access to the content that is published, but we usually have to pay for the article processing charge. And we have the hybrid model, where a subscription journal contains a mixture of open access and tall access content. So that would be the, those are the more common ones, but there are other models that are also, uh, that are also mentioned sometimes that are also exist. We have the bronze open access, which according to the university, uh, so, sorry, to the definition by UNESCO will not be real open access since this will be free access, uh, access granted by the, by a subscription uh, publisher, but it doesn't mean that you will have uh, the capacity to reuse the material. Then we have the diamond model access when uh, the publication is funded and the, therefore it's free to publish and read. And there is also the black open access, which is not really, that will not be real open access when uh, subscription, uh, subscription based content is uh, accessed in an illegal way. So which are the, the differences or between the traditional and the open access model? So in both cases, we have publicly funded research that is completed and the manuscript is submitted to a journal that can be either from a traditional journal or an open access journal. When doing so in the traditional case, the authors transfer the copyright to the journal and they don't uh, retain the rights. This will never happen on the open access. In this case, the author will always keep the, uh, the copyright. Uh, in the case of the traditional model, the, the articles that are published uh, behind, behind a paywall. This means the author will have to pay to, to access the, the information, which is usually done by the academic libraries by paying those subscriptions to grant access to the whole institution. And on the other side, in the case of the open access model, usually there is an APC, an article processing charge, and uh, that needs to be paid uh, to allow the, the content to be published, but then everything will be made available online for free to everybody. And the, there is always the possibility to reuse the content since we publish under the CC BY licenses. In this point, uh, and, and I will not go in deep into the Creative Commons licenses. I just want to show them a little bit. 
So we usually use the CC BY, which means that you can do whatever you want with the, uh, with the content that is published as long as credit is given to the creator. But there are others that can be a little bit more restrictive. Uh, I don't know, maybe uh, making sure that the content will be not used for commercial uh, purposes on or those other uh, licenses that will uh, only allow to share the content without modifying it. Anyhow, this is a uh, different options that the authors have when publishing the articles at NDPI and most of the open access publishers will always go for the CC BY, which is the, the one providing uh, a bigger freedom. So we are talking about the open access, but why is people uh, moving into the open access? Well, uh, one of the reasons is there are several benefits for it. For researchers, uh, there is an increased uh, efficiency, higher impact. This means I'm doing research maybe on climate change. I want to have an effect. I want to make sure that there is an impact on the research that I do is, is really making a difference. And of course, it's easier if the results are provided for free to everyone. This allows also to reach the general public, allows also to go into the policy makers and, and uh, probably it's easier to push for, for a change. In the case of the funders, it's basically the same. We have a greater return on investment. If you are funding research and is, there are some results coming out from there, uh, the impact is higher if that uh, those, those results are uh, available for free to everybody. And when it comes to the general public, of course, it's easier and faster to, to, to have this knowledge transfer. Then there is, we provide the opportunity to, for the public to increase the knowledge on an understanding. They, they have um, an easier way to access knowledge. And it does also promote engagement with science and research. And I have not included it here, but if we think about the industrial point of view for those uh, companies that are not able to pay for the uh, subscriptions, let's say, it's also a matter of increasing the competitivity since they will always have access to the latest um, advances in research. But it's, it's not only about the, it's not only about the advantages, but also about the mandates that are pushing uh, for the open access. I was mentioning before the planners, which was launched in 2018, uh, which is an, also an international uh, initiative. And basically, um, planners says that publicly funded research should be made publicly available. Therefore, any author who is getting funds from Plan S members, from the coalition S, they need to make uh, the results uh, available on the open access model. So uh, this was already implemented in, two, in 2021. And um, well, they are, the, the, the coalition S is offering different ways to comply with, the, with their mandates, with the, what they consider their um, the criteria, let me check, yeah, sorry for this. Okay, so which are those ways to comply with their policies? First of all, uh, the open access publishing venues. If you go and publish in an open access journal, that or platform, that should be okay. That will be uh, in the case of NDPI. And in this case, uh, funders from the coalitioners will uh, support financially the publication fees. Another way of complying with the requirements is to make available, uh, if you're going to publish in a subscription-based uh, journal, you will need to make available a version of record or uh, the author's accepted manuscript uh, available in a repository. In this case, uh, Coalition S has already said that the hybrid model will not be any longer uh, valid. And then there is a third option where the, the authors uh, can still publish in those journals who, um, who joined for the transformative agreements. But again, this is, uh, there is a um, deadline here, it's 2024. In that moment, Coalition S will not any longer support publishing in, in those journals. So everything is moving and um, 
and it seems that 2024 will be the deadline for the change into the open access. This being said, which is the current status of the um, of the publishing industry or the publishing market? For the last years, the the number of published articles in the world has been increasing. This increase this increase has been happening both in the subscription based journals and the open access journals. But the growth in the number of articles published under the open access model has been faster, uh, arriving 10% per year or so. This has led us into an interesting situation where after 2019, the number of articles published under the open access model has been higher than the number of articles published under the closed model. And this is important because right now we have those transformative agreements and probably in the following years, they will be losing their significance since uh, those transformative agreements means that uh, institutions are paying to have access to those, that closed content. But of course, if the, the closed content uh, is getting smaller in comparison with the uh, total output of articles in, uh, that, is, that are produced uh, every year. Of course, you can see also in 2021, there was a slight uh, decrease due to the pandemics. And I will now present a little bit about the NDPI and how NDPI has been supporting the open access. So uh, since it was established, uh, NDPI has had the mission to foster open scientific exchanges in all forms across all disciplines. And I will provide you some numbers for you to understand where we are today. We have over 25 years of uh, supporting the open access with, well, over 400 journals in different areas of knowledge. So more than 6,000 employees are located in 14 different uh, locations. Uh, just for you to understand the distribution, um, I'm showing here the map where the offices are placed. And this is also important because it allows us to work faster uh, since we are making the most of the time differences between the offices. We are covering uh, right now almost all the areas of knowledge. Of course, we have um, a higher impact on environmental and earth sciences, for example, and public health and healthcare. But there are also uh, uh, areas like business and social sciences that are also covered. And uh, yeah, I mean, we are publishing more on the biological size or side of the of the research. For you to have also an idea on the amount of people and institutions collaborating with us, uh, we have over 87,000 academic editors. There are more than 900 institutions that are part of our institutional open access program. They are collaborators. And we have over 170 learned societies that we work with. When it comes to the authorships, uh, number one, uh, contributor will be the United States followed by China, but we, if we group them in regions, we can see that Europe, it's like uh, the one taking the 40, over the 40% followed by Asia. And we can also see that there is a mandate related um, effect on the number of, on the proportion of open access uh, papers that we publish out of the total amount of articles published per year, where in Europe, there is an effect, the plan is, is doing, uh, is having an effect. Um, we, we can see that in plenty of the uh, European countries, we have over the 20% of the total open access published uh, by NDPI. In Japan, which is a strange case, we are almost publishing the 50% of the uh, papers uh, published in open access in Japan. This is not due to the open access mandates. In fact, in Japan, they are struggling a little bit to move into the open access, but since there are few uh, articles public open access and we do have an office there that they are doing a, a good job in fact, we have been able to attract some of those publications. So what, does, what is uh, MDPA doing for the open science? How are we complying with the requirements? So open science requires to have open peer review open data, we need to comply with the fair principles, scientific integrity needs to be granted, and we need also to support the research community. What we are doing in these areas is, uh, first of all, we are allowing the, the open uh, peer review, 
which is uh, offered as an, as an option in many of our journals. For the open data, we do uh, support people to publish not only the article, but data sets as a supplementary material. We don't have any kind of limit there. So people is uh, allowed. And in fact, we, we really recommend put to publish the data sets with them. Uh, and when it comes to the FAIR principles, uh, we make sure that the identifiers and the metadata we, we use are uh, accessible and inter uh, interoperable. And uh, we, as mentioned before, we publish under the CC BY license, which really allows to reuse all the material that we publish. On top of that, we do collaborate with clocks, logs, two institutions that make sure that even if in the case that tomorrow NDPI will stop to exist, all the articles published until today will still be available for everybody. When it comes to scientific integrity, we do collaborate with all editorial board members that we have. They are the ones making the revisions. We do have a rigorous peer review process, a rigorous peer review process in place. And uh, we do collaborate with other institutions like STM and COPE, and we make sure that we comply with the requirements that they have to ensure that there is a, a, a real scientific integrity in place. And finally, we do invest to develop new tools and services for the scholars and uh, Many of them are usually for free. So I was saying now that the academic editors are the ones that are making the decisions. Uh, of course, they are not uh, allowed to make decisions on their own manuscripts to ensure that the ethic, uh, the ethic parameters are kept. And in order to have transparency, uh, we do also publish the name of the academic editor together with the public, with the paper, so that everybody knows who is the person, the authority behind the acceptance of an article. I was mentioning also the open peer review. Last year, we published over 35,000 articles under this model. This means that the authors uh, allow us to publish also the review reports and the answers that they provide. This is very interesting since from, uh, I mean, it's interesting from the transparency point of view. Uh, it's, it's a way to make sure that the peer review process is clean. It's a way in which we can also learn a lot from the scientific community and get plenty of feedback. And even if there is usually some, um, yeah, people will not be so prone to, to share also the, the report in case uh, there is always a little bit of a fear in case uh, what will people tell about my work or whatever. It's very interesting since the whole community can see how the peer review has been done and they can also contribute to improve the quality of the paper. When we do have this option, uh, the report will be published together with the article in the, in the, well, in the website. So about quality and evaluation. Uh, we do also push hard to make sure that our journals are indexed in the most relevant databases. We do collaborate today with uh, 63 databases, 10 international ranking platforms and 10 journal directories. You can see that the numbers are growing. The number of uh, index journal has been, uh, indexed journals has been growing in all those databases every year. And I will focus now a little bit on the three main databases that we use, the Web of Science, Scopus and PubMed. For you to have an idea, only in, 2020, uh, in 2021, we had 65 new journals that were included in one of those three uh, databases. And today we have over 200 journals in the Web of Science, almost 118 Scopus and over 80 in PubMed. As, as of June of 2023, we expect to have 211 MVPI journals with an impact factor. And this is important because it will mean that we will have 75% of the journals that we have with more than three years uh, owning an impact factor, which is quite an achievement for us. And of course, we do collaborate just to finalize. We do also collaborate with external independent platforms to ensure that we, uh, we are properly evaluated. We do collaborate with Pablons. We rank the journals based on the, uh, on the reports by verified uh, reviewers and, and experts. You can go there and you can see how the MDPI journals are ranking. 
Uh, the same for the quality open access market, which will provide uh, a rank based on the experience of authors and the quality of the service that uh, the publisher is providing to them. And uh, when we go there and check the, the journals by the NDPI, I usually get uh, a good and high score. So that was all on my side, and I, I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Hello, Nai. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And could you please stop the sharing with us so you can check the question box on the below? Yes, just a second, please. Yeah, no problem. Uh, oh, yes, I'm here. So I, the first question I have uh, was by Demi. I think that this is the one that was pending about uh, yeah, how can we overcome the issue of publishing open access research for low to middle income countries? How might not be necessary uh, funding from APC uh, to provide most amount of research and as they are most impacted by climate change? That's a very, very good question. Uh, it's not easy to answer. The point is that we, the, I mean, there, there are different initiatives here than me. Uh, of course, the publishers can do something. Publishers are already waiving some of the articles by uh, by those authors from from the middle and low income countries. Uh, in MDPI, we do it based on the quality of the articles. So, if we get an article which is a good uh, good article, we may be able to to waive it. There are also initiatives like the one by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that are funding the funding the the, the public. I mean, publishing those articles, and uh, at the end, I think that this should be part also of the national mandates, ensuring that there are some fundings for those uh, for those countries. We can, as as publishers, we cannot assume the whole impact of that. Uh, it will not be sustainable for us, but it's a it's a tricky thing. Yeah. So, thank you. yes, please let me know. Um, yeah. Could you please move on to the next one? Sure. Um, so we have someone else asking about the open access movement, aiming to achieve uh, the sharing of scientific research achievements worldwide. How to ensure that sharing of scientific research achievements in developing countries? Again. Uh, not easy. I mean, it's true that we do provide information for free, but it's also true that you need a computer and an internet connection. Uh, this is something that will need to be uh, solved by national entities rather than by the publishers. Of course, on our side, we need to be ready to make everything available for free once it is, uh, these people has the capacity to, to connect, right? Next question is, what are the major benefits of open, of open current access model compared to the traditional one? Well, Janice, uh, I think that I already mentioned that a little bit, but the major benefits, uh, I will say that most of the research is funded by public uh, resources. I mean, uh, the, the funders are usually the governments and the public institutions. So this is money that is going out from the taxpayers and we allow those taxpayers to get access to the, uh, to the scientific content that they produce with the taxes. So this is one advantage. Another advantage is that um, the, the industry, the, the, the companies will have access to the latest and uh, more innovative research. So they can also develop uh, having the, that information with them, there is a higher impact also on the on the population, general population, the scientific community, and the um, policymakers. And this can be very important in cases like the climate change. If we are able to put information out there and we can have an impact, it is easier to have an effect. So that's another uh, another benefit, and for sure. Uh, when it comes to the openness, it's more democratic. We take knowledge to everybody. So I would say that those are the main advantages. LCA yet has another one, another question. Who has the rights to monitoring the action of open access and usually the research complaints from the APC? 
uh, how can we solve these indebtedness uh, problems? Well, the rates of monitoring, uh, I, I guess that you mean who is checking that the uh, publishers are behaving properly. Uh, in this case, uh, I will talk about NDPI. Uh, we do belong to different uh, organizations like COPE, which is the one granting the ethics in publications, or the STM, which is the uh, the bigger uh, the biggest uh, organization for the um, scientific and technical publishers. Uh, they do have some parameters, some uh, some criteria that we we have to fulfill, and we are we need to comply with them if if we want to be. Uh, part of those uh, entities. So they are the ones, let's say, that may have the capacity to monitor. About the APCs, yeah, of course, the ideal thing would be to have everything for free. That is possible only in case if the government decide to fund the, uh, the cost. I mean, as I was showing before, for example, NDPI is a very big company. There are more than like 6,000 workers, including me and my colleagues. And we all have a salary because we are here working more than eight hours per day. So the idea is there is a cost. We need to cover it. Where the money is coming from, that's the debate. It's not easy to solve, but uh, but yeah, I will say that having the uh, the APCs funded by the libraries, as they have been doing by with the subscription model, will have will will have a positive uh, effect on that. And finally. Uh, someone else is asking about the quality and quantity seems always to be opposite. <laughs> What's your opinion? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, the, it's true that we are publishing more and more. In the, that's the case for MBPI, but also for other publishers. That's clear. I mean, we are publishing more because there are, there are more articles published in the world. And there are more articles published in the world because there is more research being funded in different countries. So we cannot uh, keep publishing five if we are doing uh, if we are funding research to have ten. Let's say, of course, we need to be careful. We need to be uh, vigilant, and we need to have strong peer review processes in place to make sure that what is published does comply with the quality criteria. But uh, I don't think that in the 21st century, we, we can just uh, reduce or quote the number of articles that are published. Otherwise, we will probably be stopping the, the scientific development. I don't know if there are any other questions by anyone. I guess, I guess that's all. Uh, we have so many questions. We have to choose some of them for answering. I hope that's fine. And thank you so much, Unai, for your presentation and, of course, for answering so many questions. And uh, let's move on to the next part. Is our roundtable discussion about open access model. Yeah, Juno, could you please uh, help us share the screen? Uh, we um, encourage all the audience to join us for this question. Yes, and uh, we would like to discuss some topics about the open access model. And um, Professor Lucas and the Professor Pakal, uh, could you please open up your microphone? Uh, yeah, we would like to invite you to answer some of them. Yeah. Okay, I think the first one I would like to uh, invite uh, Professor Lucas. Yeah, how do you understand the theme of open for climate justice of this International Open Access Week? Well, how I understand uh, the theme, uh, open for climate justice. Uh, well, this is uh, an initiative, um, you know, to promote uh, open access uh, publication or communication, in general, scientific communication uh, within the scientific uh, community for this specific uh theme for climate uh, justice and um, uh, this is quite uh, good because uh, climate uh, change and uh, justice uh, is uh, um, very 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 significant okay and uh, we talk about uh, climate change uh, i don't have the figures of uh, how many 
uh, publications, uh, conferences, and so on, uh, deal with these issues of climate change, um, climate change and uh, the impacts um, in economy, in uh, human health, in um, uh, water resources, in uh, natural hazards, and so on. So uh, all this uh, work uh, that is uh, uh, done right now, okay, in the previous years and the years followed, uh, should be disseminated freely, uh, communicated uh, freely uh, to all um, the people around uh, the globe. Um, and uh, I think uh, this is the mandate uh, for that, uh, for the open access. Uh, well, there are some problems uh, with problems, not problems, I think, um, uh, Dr. Vicario talked about that, uh, about um, who is paying uh, for handling uh, the papers. And uh, well, the, uh, the route that we have, the, the golden route, uh, the authors pay for uh, this. But uh, there are also some, uh, I would say, subsidies from uh, the uh, publication, uh, uh, from the publishers, um, uh, as uh, well as uh, for uh, the MDPI. Um, also, there are uh, some um, waivers uh, given to, um, to the editors, uh, to the guest editors, uh, to invite good papers. And uh, the, the critical question is the quality for that. It's not uh, the geographical uh, location of the author. Uh, of course, if we do have the say that both of them, I mean, good quality paper from a good, um, from a, a poor country, that would be great, okay? And this, uh, we can give uh, the um, uh, free of charge uh, publication uh, to these uh, people. The other thing is that um, in the well-developed uh, countries, um, the research pro uh, projects, mainly I would speak about uh, the European Union, uh, well, they uh, emphasize that the publication will follow either the gold or green route of open access. So, and um, there are other publishers uh, that they follow. The truth is that uh, all the publishers or some of the publishers that they were on the opposite side of open access, the last uh, 10 years have changed. And many of uh, the, the journals that uh, they were, you know, closed, Okay, um, uh, not open. Uh, this is, <laughs> it's uh, contrary to open, but closed. Uh, they moved to either a hybrid model, publishing both open access and traditional, okay, uh, way or papers. And, uh, um, or they moved uh, to uh, making uh, many, uh, journals, uh, open access, fully open access. So, yeah, there are uh, questions uh, about that, about the quality. And uh, as I told uh, you before, that uh, we have to be very careful. We have uh, very strict on the rules of quality uh, for a publication. But I think that, uh, uh, you know, about... Uh, 60% of uh, the papers uh, are rejected because of the poor quality. So, uh, where's, well, I'm speaking about water, okay? But I think more or less the same is uh, for the other journals, uh, open access journals of MDPI. 
All right. Thank you so much for your answer. I, I think you have already presented um, the inside of open access and climate change in your presentation before. And of course, MDPI always cherish the quality of every paper. And we also would like to uh, express our gratitude to your contribution to the journal Water. And the second question, I would like to uh, invite Unai. Yeah. Hi, Unai. And I ask you uh, that what do you think of the, about the open access model? Well, thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, I'm working here at MDPI, so you will always expect me to say that it's the best thing. But the truth is that I've been a researcher before being here. Uh, and I can remember when I was doing my PhD uh, and I was trying to get some information when we had some articles that were not uh, covered by the, by the institution, it was always a mess. I mean, this important information that is still closed behind those paywalls. And I'm very much a supporter of the democratic share of um, knowledge. Thus, I'm, I'm quite a fan of the open access model. I think that in, specifically in cases like climate change or some other uh, issues that um, affect the, the whole uh, community, the whole uh, population, it's important to make sure that the information is there. It's important that important to make sure that researchers like the one by like Lucas and Dr. Lucas and Krakauer uh, arrives to the correct people, and we we create a community uh, mindset in which we can really push to make some changes. So I'm I'm quite a supporter, and but I'm probably not the most uh, impartial person. To, so. All right, thank you, Unai. And the second and the third question, I would like to invite Professor Korkel for your answer. And um, I want to ask that what is the positive impact has open access had on your field of research? If I can ask you this question. Well, I think it's had a positive impact uh, just in terms of being able to access the full publications uh, from uh, you know, that, that, that are relevant to my field. Uh, so my university uh, has subscriptions to a lot of uh, paywalled journals, uh, but not all of them. Uh, so there, there are many that are difficult to access. I can try to send an email to the author and ask them to send a copy, uh, but you know maybe they're unavailable or, or the email is not current. Uh, so it's it's uh, extra obstacles uh, that are not present for open access. Uh, I can also um, recommend those open access articles to colleagues that are institutions or students uh, who may not have access uh, to uh, their, their subscriptions for, uh, for the journal publishers. Uh, so I think just having the information more widely available. And I think that uh, in the long run, this is also good for the uh, quality of articles that they are, can be seen by a, a larger audience and people can comment on them uh, easily and evaluate their quality firsthand. All right, thank you so much. And thank you for so much for your support. Uh, you, you're a uh, guest editor in so many <laughs> journal of MDPI, and I guess you're a kind of support of open access model. And uh, all the audience, if you wanted to join us for the discussion and uh, share us your story about open access, uh, please raise up your hand. Uh, if I can see you, I can unmute you. Okay, so uh, Juno, please uh, stop the screen sharing with us. Thank you. And if we do not have more audience, join us for discussion. And that is the end of MDPI 2022 Open Access Week webinar. And before we call it the end for today, I would like to briefly introduce that MDPI joins um, 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals Publisher Compact which are the blueprints to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. And I have already posted the announcement in the chat box below for all the audience, you can see them. And if you are interested in more details, please feel free to contact us by email. Yeah, the email is also present in the question box if you're interested in it. And okay then, so I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Lucas and Professor Krokow and Dr. Vicario for their great presentation about climate justice and for sharing their opinion of open access with us. 
And we would like to thank all the audience for spending your precious time with us and hope we can see you next time. So I will call it end for today. Okay, thank you so much for your hey, support. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank goodbye. You. Okay, thank you so goodbye. much for your precious time. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, I will end meeting for all, right? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, goodbye.